we create our own opportunities in life. What you do through adherence to process, through an intense willingness to invest in the mundanity of life. Because let's face it, those 11 mile runs every single morning are redundant, but that's the part of it that makes it so rich. It makes it so fulfilling because you create your own opportunity. The opportunity is December the 3rd. Opportunity is for you to go out and have the best athletic performance and the best athletic moment of your life. The opportunity to succeed, the opportunity to have a transcendent performance on December the 3rd, that's all there. But it is only created by those 11 mile runs in the pitch black on a hilly course in Nashville when nobody's looking. In life, we have to understand that we create our own opportunities. And then when the window opens, we have a choice to either dive through that window or let the window slam shut and then watch the rest of the world go by on the other side of the window. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to thank you for tuning in and supporting the brand. Now, I have spent the last decade plus of my life building Bare Performance Nutrition, and we create effective supplements that you can trust to support your wellness, endurance, and performance goals. We offer high quality, great tasting whey protein powders, effective pre-workouts, superfoods, sleep support, electrolytes, and much more. So if you wanna support the content that we produce and the message that I am sharing through my content and on this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you went to BPNSUPS dot com and you can use code Nick Bear 10 to save 10% off your next order. So thank you guys. I appreciate you and let's dive into the show. What's going on guys? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today I have the man who helped me run sub three hours right. and has progressively helped me get faster. Jeff Cunningham, we are here to talk about running. We are here to talk about CIM, which is the next race that I am personally running right. on December 3rd, going for a sub 245 marathon. And we're going to talk about how to PR your next race, get faster, right. run smarter, and keep kicking ass. So Jeff, welcome back. Man, it's always a pleasure. Um, excited to be in Nashville. Um, haven't been back in a while. And uh, i flattered and honored as usual to just hop on here and just talk a lot about something that I'm just absolutely completely over my heels excited about and passionate about sport of running, man. Well, every time we get together and we talk about running, talk about what we're experiencing with running yeah. a prep, uh, the response is always great. And, you know, you have helped a lot of people yeah. improve and get better. How was that response from the online running community and kind of what you have pro provided for them. Like how is, how was that felt from, from your side? It feels uh, almost surreal because when you're doing something that you're so passionate about and it comes so um, um, naturally to you, you, you know, I think in general, and I'm talking about people in general, I think uh, uh, people would probably agree with me that you don't think of yourself as an expert, whatever that sort of self-adulatory designation may, may be. You don't think of yourself as anything unique. I'm just a guy from Tyler, Texas that drives a pickup truck, you know, who happens to know a little something about running, but it's really, really fun looking at the impact. In fact, yesterday on my Instagram, um, I was actually super proud of a, of a young guy who just signed a college scholarship. And what I said was, um, people don't realize that the people who I coach contribute far more to my life then I've actually contributed to theirs. And I think people are surprised by the fact that I'm flattered, honored, and I'm moved to a, a, a pretty emotional state when people just say, thank you. Because to me, um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see it as anything um, that incredible. Um, it just comes naturally and I just love it and I just want everybody to succeed. Yeah? So I don't mean to put you on the spot with this question, but I'm currently reading this book and it's called Show Your Work. And the whole concept of this book is about documenting the process of learning and doing and sharing that with other people and that by other people watching your work and the process of that work, they gain just as much as you are gaining. 
through that process. My question for you is, do you consider yourself an expert? I don't think of it in those terms. Um, to me, that's sort of a self-aggrandizing sort of statement to make about yourself. It's an overly self-adulatory sort of designation. I don't get to call myself an expert, right? In fact, we were just leaving the airport, and my wife told me that I don't get to call myself a great driver. Other people get to tell me I'm a good driver, right? We were disputing which exit to take. But in all seriousness, people uh, seem to have gravitated toward that spot in some instances, and it consider me an expert. Frankly, I consider myself more a student of the art of coaching, and I spend a whole lot of time looking up at the mountaintop at people who I perceive who are far more knowledgeable than I am, who are better at it than I am. The same way, a lot of runners who are considered fairly elite, such as yourself, right? You, 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 you spend a lot of time looking at people who are faster than you, and you're not going to call yourself good, great, elite. You'll let other people call you that. So no, I don't, I don't wake up thinking, man, I'm an expert. Ugh, that's so off-putting, and I don't even think of it in those terms. I'm just trying to do the best I can. I think people that often consider themselves an expert believe in their own mind they have reached the, the pinnacle of what it is, and they stop pursuing the process. In this book, one of the key takeaways, I'm only like 30 pages in at this point, but great read, Great, quick, easy read okay. called Show Your Work. And it dives into, the author dives into this concept of the curious amateur. And the curious amateur is so hungry for the pursuit of success and embracing the journey that they just want to keep learning. They are this, this student. And I think if you view yourself as a curious amateur, also could be known as a student, as opposed to an expert, no matter how much you've achieved or where you can hang your hat, you will keep pursuing growth and helping people mm -hmm. in that journey. Exactly. And the curious amateur is what I see myself as some people refer to me as a professional coach. I guess on some level, if you're ever paid $1 to do anything, technically, I guess you could call yourself a professional. I, I, I don't really know where that, where that line of demarcation is, so to speak, right? But I can tell you that I view myself as the curious amateur. Keep in mind, and you know, most people probably know this who are watching this, but a lot may not. I'm an, I'm an attorney. I'm a JD. That's a doctor of jurisprudence. I'm not a PhD, okay? I didn't have any formal training in labs in Alamosa, Colorado Springs, the Olympic Training Center. Um, I, um, I'm not an MD. I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a scientist. I've learned enough science to be good at this. So I'm always trying to learn, trying to evolve. Two weeks ago, I'm sure you noticed it on your last big long run workout, or maybe it was last weekend, right? You did more volume of fast-paced work than I've ever had you do in a long-run workout. Because I looked at it and I thought, physiologically, I think this is where he is and what he can handle. So I even switched things up a little bit and added a little bit more of that high-end, um, faster marathon pace work uh, uh, down to as fast as your LT pace. And I had never given you that much before. It was 421 right? Two times a four, two, one. You did 14 miles of work at sub six minute pace. I've never had you do that much. So I'm learning. I'm evolving. I'm, I'm, I'm the curious amateur coach who coaches a lot of people who are doing sort of elite-ish, uh, uh, very, very non-amateur-ish things in the marathon. But I don't view my coaching ability and my coaching acumen is anywhere near a glossy finished product. If I ever get to that spot, I'm going to stop coaching if I think I'm done learning. Because what, what would the fun be in that if you don't ever think you have anything to learn? Yeah. No, I mean. It's arrogant. I, exactly. It is. How, how much better of a coach do you think you've gotten over this last two years as you've coached more people? Infinitely. I, Infinitely. Yeah, because you have so much more data yes. that you've learned from. Here's the other thing, though. Here's the other thing, though. And this is something that I think people aren't super comfortable with. 
but I really, really am. You are what you coach. You are who you have coached. And right now, um, uh, without going too deep into the weeds, uh, 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 BPN and people who I coach who uh, are, are BPN athletes and um, on Bat City Track Club in Austin, we've got, we've got five runners in the UL, U.S. Olympic Trials Marathon through careful design and planning, stuff that I've gotten so much better at over the last two years because I get to guinea pig you. I get to guinea pig them. I get to guinea pig runners all over the globe. And you start figuring out what works, what tweaks work. And I tell you what, it's not wholesale philosophical change to get you there. It's minute little tweaks. It's little changes here, little changes there, like adding two extra miles to your marathon pace working and workout. It's not suddenly going from not doing it to doing it. Well, we're past that. But I'm infinitely better because of the seemingly innocuous things that I've changed in my approach to fueling, rest, recovery, um, volume of fast pace, running, all of that holistically. I'm just better. So you've helped me go from a 324 marathon to a 256. And then from a 256 to a 248 that we did in, in Buffalo, I guess that was almost two years ago now. It was, it was June of 2022? May, yeah, end of May. Yeah. May, May of uh, 22. Yeah. And now we're going for a sub 245. Let's talk about this, this prep that, uh, that I'm in right now for CIM. And the way you've approached this prep while working with me, what did you change in my programming, if anything, from this last prep that, that led me to a 248 marathon mm. to this prep where we're going for a sub 245 marathon? What's the difference? There is a, a confluence of two thought processes that go into anything that we do in life. We're all familiar with the uh, uh, with the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But just because it ain't broke don't mean we can't tweak it, right? All right? I like tweaking. So, so we, 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 uh, 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 don't, don't, don't say you like tweaking because people are like, Nick Bear's a tweaker. That's going to be the next big thing, right? That's, That's out there. Yeah, there we That's go. Next big. Uh, okay, so we know what works and we know what worked. But, uh, 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 so the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it philosophy is what we rolled into the build, uh, uh, with is our foundation understanding. We still had to make some changes, right? Or you would just go back and run the same thing that you did. Right. And I find actually globally that that's one of the big challenges for a lot of people in the distance running space and the marathoning space is they do the same thing over and over expecting a different result when you've got to look at it and say, I wanted to get from here to there. What I did didn't quite get me the result that I wanted. What do I need to change? So what did we do? Um, you're doing a little bit more just total volume of running. Nothing that's just some massive like shift in philosophy, but you're, 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 you know, four to eight to 10 miles a week more than what you were going in to Buffalo. Right. And if it was just two or three weeks, eh, probably wouldn't make a difference. But over the course of 10 to 12 weeks, well, you're going to run possibly as much as an extra 10 miles a week for two and a half, three months at a time. You're going to net some aerobic gains by just simply spending more time on your feet. So that's the one thing we did. The next thing I did was I slightly increased the volume of your repeat sessions and your lactate threshold sessions, especially your repeat sessions. They've gotten bigger. Um, that one workout that I had you do, where I think you went 2K, 1K, 2K, 1K, 2K, 1K, 2K. If right. I'm remembering right, that's 11,000 meters of work. And then I've assigned 11K of work when used to it would be nine or 10, right? On a lot of your interval sessions. Not all the time, but quite often during this build, we've done that. And then challenging you with pace. Listen, here's the deal, man. If you want to race faster, and I'm not real bright, I, like I said, I'm just, I grew up in the middle of the woods in East Texas, but, but, but correct me if I'm wrong. If you want to get faster, you might want to try to actually run faster. I don't know. Call me crazy. So what we did was is I said, okay, 
How does that feel? Okay, let's go a little faster. Let's go a little faster. Well, you did eight times a mile repeat and averaged like 527 last week, something along those lines, Yeah. right? I couldn't I couldn't have thrown you out of an airplane with a center block and tied to your ankle two years ago. You couldn't have run more than two or three reps at that pace on a minute recovery. There's no way, right? And so uh, um, through a meticulous process by which you just consistently ran for the last three years, we added more total volume to your running in this block and then added more volume um, within certain sessions like your repeat sessions at faster paces. We've just made you a better runner consistently and appropriately applied stress that's not some major philosophical shift from what you did it was a philosophical shall we say tweak on a few uh very carefully calculated days and workouts that have really made the difference yeah i want to talk about volume for a little bit yeah because i was actually thinking about this on my run this morning mm. right now in this training block my my average run on any given day is at least 10, 11 miles. Uh, yeah. There's, re there's really only one day a week I run 10 miles. The rest is above 11. And I was thinking back to that first marathon prep we did together. Now, granted, I was also in a Ironman prep during that. So I was on the bike a lot and I was swimming a lot as well. But I believe my daily run back in 2021 in preparation for that marathon was seven miles a day. Mm -hmm. And then when we went and ran Buffalo for the 248, I believe my average was like nine miles a day. That's correct. So we've slowly ramped mileage up to get to this point. Mm -hmm. You know, when we started the prep, even before I started training for last man standing, and we were talking about where running mileage was gonna get to, we're talking like mid to high 70s towards the peak of the build. And I'm thinking, well, what is like an average day, you know, running there? You're like 11 miles. You're like, holy crap, 11 miles a day. Like that's, that's a lot of running. It's a lot of mileage. But then you get to this point in a build where 11 miles just feels like, like nothing. Like mm -hmm. every morning you wake up, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, 11 miles. That's, that's easy. Wednesday morning, critical velocity or, or lactate threshold workout of, 14 miles of work, oh, that's nothing. That's easy. Then you go into these big 20, 21, 22 mile workouts. I don't want to say it's easy, but you're 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 recovered by the next morning. Right. And that is the body's just adaptation to a stimulus and growing and becoming more effective and efficient over time. I want to talk about how important training volume is for the endurance athlete as someone is training to run faster because you hear so many different extremes. Mm -hmm. You hear the person on one side who's saying you need at least a hundred miles a week mm -hmm. to run certain paces in certain times. And then you hear the other extreme. It's like, no, 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 you don't need, you don't need more than 45 miles a week. Right. Where's the sweet spot? How do we view running mileage? How has it changed based off of the experience of the runner? What is perfection in terms of where should people start with training volume? It's a, it's a, it's a sort of a multifactorial analysis that I have to engage in with each athlete. Um, and it typically comes down to injury resilience and bandwidth, right? Um, you know, I have some folks who uh, are working so hard and they're so uh, 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 busy and spread thin in so many areas, uh, um, often uh, out of necessity. If you're trying to run a law firm and you've got uh, two small children at home and you're trying to be the best parent that you can be, um, there might be limits on how much you can actually dedicate emotionally and physically to running. Um, that actually is a runner who I coach up in the Northeast. Um, and she actually just ran 257 in a marathon at Hartford in October. Um, well, what was and, her weekly mileage? Uh, she was probably in the 60 to 65 range, right? Not running as much as you because uh, there was just limits to what we were going to be able to get done there, right? But the reality of it is, uh, uh, the easiest way to put it is we got to run as much as you can 
uh, without rolling over undue amounts of fatigue and getting um, overly banged up and injured on a consistent basis. And typically through a little bit of trial and error, but a whole lot of forethought and careful planning, we can arrive at that spot for each athlete. I was asked on a podcast with another podcaster about what my thoughts were on low volume, high intensity marathon plans. And I picked my words very, very carefully because I don't like to just wave a really, really broad sword because for some people that might be the best solution to their limited time and the limited bandwidth they have to train for a, a more just elapsed time a day because of time constraints. But generally speaking, low volume, high intensity marathon training programs are not the best idea. If they were, you would go and look at the nation's top 50 or 60 marathoners on the men's side and the top 50 or 60 American women. And, and you would see a whole bunch of people doing a low volume, high intensity plans. And none of them are as in zero. Nobody's doing that. So volume is the most vital component. One runner who I coach who has now become a, a really, really good runner. Um, she's one of the top uh, uh, marathoners in Canada. She was not two years ago. She looked at me one day. She came down to train with the team in February. She looked at me. She said, coach, has a really long workout. And I said, Michelle, you run really, really long races. If you don't want to run big workouts and you don't want to run volume, don't run marathons. Don't run half marathons. Volume's huge. Because we know the human physiology is such that you get increased mitochondrial density, distal capillarization with appropriately applied moderate aerobic distress on a repeated basis, day after day, week after week, month after month. The more, the more you can run and not roll over undue fatigue and run the risk of injury, you are going to be a better marathoner, right? So I don't say 100 miles a week. Well, you know, for some people, high mileage might be 80 to 85, and that's the that's the most we're going to do safely, and that's going to be their sweet spot. I have another runner, right, who can run 100 miles a week, right? Mitch Ammons can run 100 miles a week. Is that what Mitch does on an In our, in our peak, peak phases, uh, into the last two big marathons where he ran 216 uh, 50 at CIM last year, then he just ran 216.01 in New York in October. Um you know, um, 95, 90, 100 miles a week is the norm. What's, yeah. For him, what's like an easy Monday, Tuesday run? How long? Uh, uh, a lot of times twice a day. Maybe go and hit 10 in the morning and then four or five in the evening uh, running, you know, probably seven minute pace per mile. Sometimes as slow as 715, 720 a mile. You know, when you're running 15 miles a day. Right. But then just the other day, he goes, wow, that went better than I thought. And I was like, yeah, let me check your splits. He ran five miles in like 24 something the other day in practice. Gosh, I think he closed in 449 on the fifth mile. That was his first hard workout back. But, but the point is for him, it's 95 to 100. For you, you know, we're like 75 to 80 in this prep most weeks, which is really high volume. Right. Um, on 45 to 50 miles a week, you could not begin to hope to do what you're doing. You couldn't even hope to do it. It would be um, fantasy. And by definition, fantasy is not reality. And I don't know about you, but I live in reality. We got to have the work match the goal, right? Don't tell me that you want to do calculus, but then all you're willing to do in practice is simple arithmetic. You're going to flunk that exam, man. And that's what I love about fitness. And that's what I love about the marathon. The marathon is my favorite distance running by far. And to say that you want to do a marathon, anyone can commit to a marathon today and run 100%. a marathon tomorrow. And that marathon is probably going to run you instead of you running the marathon. Oof. Yeah. But in order to keep getting faster and faster and faster, you can only make so much progress in a given training block mm. in a given year. And it often takes years and years and years to, to build that ability to run a marathon at a certain time. Yeah. I would also argue that if you, if you tried putting me in the, in the same training block that I'm in right now, three years ago, <laughs> there's no way one, I couldn't hit the splits, but two, my body wouldn't be able to recover the way it is now. And that's just due to the physical adaptations that my body has learned 
and acquired through continuous, consistent effort. Yeah, you would have broken, right? Yeah. Everybody's breakable and we have to treat our bodies with kindness. We have to treat our bodies um, um, as if they are breakable, but we also have to understand that our bodies are the greatest machine in the history of, uh, of, of earth like any machine. We cannot build a machine that's better than the one that we have. Uh, but we have to understand the machine's limitations and the machine's uh, uh, promise to us that if we take care of it and we feed it what it needs, it will make the adaptations within, within reason, right? Um, and so the reality is, is you are where you are right now because you've adopted something that is becoming unfortunately quintessentially un-American. Patience, right? I have a lot of it. And it's a lament of mine that um, um, I see people who have so much promise and have so much potential, but don't have the patience to uh, see it, to see it through and just understand. See, I've got people on a five-year plan and I'm not going to name their names, right? Because these are conversations that we have that are private, that people might say that you're a little bit nuts for talking about it. But I've got some runners who I coach right now who are on a five-year plan uh, for the 2028 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. And so I'll have some people call me up who are maybe a little bit less uh, 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 sort of familiar with the process of marathoning. And I say, well, I want to go and do this. I says, hey, man, you, you know, you're giving yourself 10 weeks to do something that might take um, 10 months or a year and a half or two years. And then I tell them about some of my people that have a five-year plan to get to a goal in running with the expectation that you're going to make just incremental progress month to month and week to week. And there's a lot of people that just tap out. They're like, well, I just don't have the patience for that. And this is the self-circuiting that we've done culturally that I'm, I'm, I'm fighting it. I'm always going to lean into that headwind. I'm never going to succumb to it and try to go for low volume, high intensity. Um, I call it the American shortcut, right? You got rapid cleaners. We have drive through liquor stores now in Texas. We got, you know, um, um, rapid filing on the tax returns. We got, you know, instant cup of soup. I mean, you go ask somebody if they know how to take chicken stock and you boil your chicken and your vegetables, you chop them up and you do all that. They're like, well, I don't know. I just go and get the hungry man meal and put it, pop it in the microwave and beep, beep, beep and go and nuke it and, you know, hope the microwave doesn't blow up and have mashed potatoes all over the wall. I mean, that's what, that, that's where we are. Just everything to be fast, fast, fast. So mm -hmm. I tell people, let's be super fast. Let's be uh, super quote unquote efficient um, in all these other things, so to speak, but you cannot create more efficiency in running by rushing the process. You will actually hurt yourself because you will actually physically get injured. You will get frustrated and frustration is the largest hurdle to human development and human progress is frustration. I got frustrated so I quit law school. I got frustrated so I quit trying to master uh, photography. I got frustrated with running because it didn't come as fast as and easy as Nick Bear makes it look in his videos. So I stopped after six weeks and I tell people, breathe deep. Let's be patient. Let's use the machine that we have been given, which is our human body, but we must be deferential to its physiology and the science that goes into getting adaptations. And you cannot change the fact that your body is only going to develop at a certain rate. And you cannot, you cannot rush it or you're, 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 you're in peril. You're in peril. I think it's one thing actually that running teaches a lot of people is patience. Yeah, man. There's so many people who want to start running and then they try it and it hurts. It's uncomfortable. I often hear the the response. I just don't get it. You know, I, I am bored. I'm bored of this. Mm. And then it's one of those things though, where the people who embrace the patience mm. required to consistently keep running that achieve and are rewarded with all the benefits that it provides emotionally, physically, mentally, that, that is one of, in my opinion, as you bring that up and I think about it, the, the greatest outcomes of 
starting and learning and embracing how to run. And that is applicable to all other parts of your life, whether it's your family, it's building a business, it's your work, it's conversations with other people. Being patient is such a, a critical, important skill that you can master through the art of running. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes um, ultimate patience is sometimes confused with um, lack of get up and go and lack of ambition. Right. That guy's he's just not he's just not intense enough. We gotta have it all now. We gotta go get that. He's gonna get, gotta go get after it. That guy, that guy's dragging his feet. Well, he's not dragging his feet. He's not lacking ambition. He's not lacking get up and go. He simply is recognizing that the patient approach is a good one. Now, I'm not saying that um, you know, we have to take longer than we need to to get stuff done. We got to make sure that we're not doing that. But the reality is, is um, uh, you got to talk to people who understand what they're doing and um, allow yourself in any, in any arena to be coachable. Always be coachable, right? If you are trying to learn how to be a diesel mechanic, understand that you got to listen to an expert right? Who is a diesel mechanic and who's teaching you how to do it and don't try to cut corners and don't try to rush the process or you're going to end up not accomplishing your goal. Um, be coachable, be a listener, be a learner and running can teach patience. And I really like what you said there because you're right. Even if you don't bring patience to the table, sometimes running can teach the patience. I'm not sure that the patience needs to be a predicate to running, but running is sure going to teach it to you. Um, sometimes the hard way, sometimes the easy way, depending on whether or not you have uh, some sort of massive flame out in a race or you get injured or whatever. But yeah, it doesn't necessarily, one doesn't necessarily have to precede the other. But at the end of the day, patience is always going to be the element of development as a distance runner, for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. One of the things I did want to talk about in regards to this prep, from, from my perspective, some things that have changed and that are different that I believe have had significant impact on, yeah. on the outcome. Because I would argue that I'm in the best running shape of my life right now. Not debatable. N not debatable. I'm, I'm hitting paces and splits that I've never hit before yeah. at an effort that is lower than I've ever experienced before. I was thinking about this. One, I, have, I've, I haven't missed any workouts, which I never do. I never, I never physically miss a workout in terms of like, I always show up and put forth the effort. But there have been times in these last couple of preps we've done together where I've missed hitting splits in times. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I send over my, after every Wednesday morning track workout or lactate threshold workout, I screenshot my my Garmin data. I send it over to you and you call me within a matter of minutes. <laughs> Typically. And then Saturday, I did the same thing. I, I screenshot my data. I send it over to you. One thing I can say about this, this prep we're in right now, there hasn't been one workout where I have not missed a split. Mm -mm. I've run significantly faster than what you have prescribed it, in all these workouts. In, in many cases, yes. So there, there hasn't been, and I'm proud of that. I'm really proud of the fact that I have, like, I've just blown through all these training sessions. And I think there's, like I said, there's, there's some reasons. Um, in our last podcast episode, you talked about the difference between being all in versus all consumed. I'm typically someone who is all consumed by a fitness prep. This is one of the first, if not the first fitness prep I've ever done where I'm all in as opposed to all consumed. Mm. My life has more balance. I'm spending more time with family. I am going out to dinner more with my wife now that we're in a new city. I'm still consuming alcohol from time to time. Nothing crazy, a drink or two here and there. I am all in on this prep as opposed to all consumed and I'm running faster than mm. ever. Another change is that I'm here in Tennessee as opposed to Texas. When I was in Texas, everything I was running was flat. I got to Tennessee in the Nashville area. Those first couple of weeks here broke me off. There's hills everywhere. I'm running uphill and downhill on all of my easy runs. Right. Now, when I do these big Wednesday workouts, Saturday workouts, 
I'm finding these flat stretches to get a more accurate read of of where I'm at. Sure. But the rest of the volume throughout the week, I'm I'm climbing hills, I'm running down hills, pounding on my quads. Those are two of the differences that I've made in this prep as opposed to previous ones. But if there's one thing that I do really well, and I would love your your take on this, is that I set the conditions in order for success to follow. So if I know there's a big workout, and I've talked about this a lot in this podcast and in my content, because I'm, I'm a massive believer in it. Tomorrow, for example, I have a, a long run for Saturday. Today, I'm going to hyper-focus and emphasize hydration, electrolyte intake. I'm going to make sure I get more carbs in. I'm going to keep my diet very clean, focused, stay off my feet, get a good night's sleep tonight, lay out all my clothes before I go to bed, have my nutrition prepped for the morning, have a fuel plan and strategy for the workout throughout the duration tomorrow. I'm setting the conditions to make sure I succeed for every single workout, every single run moving through this build in preparation to run sub 245. If there's one thing that I do well at, it's that I know how to set the conditions to succeed and to win. I would love your take on that where you see athletes uh, excel with that trait and where they fail and neglect setting the conditions. Runners love running. A lot of runners don't love uh, the quote unquote non-running things that set the table and set the conditions for the running itself to go well. The big difference um, that I see right now with you is that you have so much more neurologic uh, bandwidth and less neurologic clutter. You have less cortisol coursing through your veins on a day-to-day -day basis now than you have at any point since I've met you. Uh, That's in true. a word, it's very true. In a word, you're you just got less life stress right now, right? Yeah. We know that cortisol and stress that that that's the byproduct of stress. Okay, both good stress and bad stress uh, is a um, impediment to performance in the endurance space. Sluggishness, uh, 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 um, um, inability to focus. Um, um, just basically just sort of feeling kind of rotten a lot. Um, and so you're sleeping more than you ever have in the last two years. You are spending quality, neurologically calming and emotionally uh, a fulfilling time with Steph and with Charlie. Okay. Mm -hmm. Please keep posting the videos of Charlie the other day. Uh, I think she looks like she could squat a Toyota right now, man. Honestly, like her. Like, what's up, man? Her squat ability is incredible. She gets in the squat position all the time. Yeah. Uh, it, it's crazy. Like, kids and babies know how their body naturally is supposed to move. And as we get older, you know, it gets stuck and tight and we lose mobility. But Charlie's squat form is spot on. She is so powerful. Love that. In the depth of the, the, the squat. <laughs> she, amazing, man. Whether she's she, trying to pick something up or, or poop her pants. Right. Uh, well, 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 hey, listen, uh, uh, the only people in the world who are allowed to poop their pants are really old guys and really young guys, right? So, yeah, true. There we go. But, you know, in all seriousness, man, I mean, the fact that we're sitting here laughing and talking about Charlie and, 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 and all this, you're just, you're just so much more relaxed, you know, and you're happy and you're sleeping and you're not dealing with, 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 with shit shows and dumpster fires and, oh my God, waking up at three o'clock in the morning. Did I, did I send that email? You're just not dealing with a lot of that stuff, right? That you had to deal with. Okay. And that's when I talk about bandwidth. Some people need to run five days a week and they can only run 45 miles a week because they got those things going on and that's the best they can do in anything you can do. If you can run one mile, you're a runner. Right. So I'm not I'm not saying that, you know, if you can't run big volume, don't go run marathons. I'm just saying that it's better to try. You're able to handle all that now because neurologically you're not fried. Right. All the wiring that had all the casing stripped off of it. You've got all that casing back on the wire. Mm -hmm. Right. You've got nice, strong electrical impulses going exactly where they need to be without this sort of scattered, frayed thing. 
That means you are going to feel better on interval sessions. You're going to feel better on lactate threshold sessions, right? Because it's all very neurologic, right? It starts with the sort of the ENIAC or the univac of the human race, which is our brain, right? So your brain has more rest. So your body is at its best. I think I just made up a little saying there. I love that. That's always, awesome. You always have at least one during yeah. every podcast. So, so that's the major thing I see is you're just, you're sleeping more. You're not as neurologically fried. And so it's leading to you being able to do this. And then also you're not all consumed by it because you have enough free time. You have enough um, 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 satisfying time to just simply um, engage in recreation and just downtime, just sitting on the couch, watching Charlie just grow and develop and all the joys of fatherhood that you're just, you're just not as tired, man. And you don't have uh, 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 this this whole idea of like every waking moment that's not spent uh, worrying about exactly how many pallets of whey protein powder do we have and distribution, you know, uh, uh, snags and all that stuff that you don't worry about as much now as you used to. You can then have more free time dedicated not to simply going, well, I'm going to think more about running and I'm going to hyper more about running. No, 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 no. You're actually able to just use that time in just neurologically calming activities that's allowed you now to just simply be all in rather than have all of what little free time you had all consumed with the obsession of the next marathon. That's how I perceive that you're feeling so good right now. Yeah, I, I, I got really good for years at burning the candle at both ends. If there was a three-ended candle, you would have you lit all three ends. Easily. God, man. Remember, but remember when we sat in your office about a year and a half ago, too, I don't remember uh, when we were planning one of our preps or something. We had a meeting and you and I both looked at each other and you're like, you're tired. And I looked at you, I'm like, no, you're tired. And we're like, so is it hard to write an email right now? And you're like, yeah, it's pretty hard. I'm like, me too, man. And we just both had that that thousand yard stare yep. where we were just, we're just, 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 just burning it, just burning it, man. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, that's like, that was part of the process to get here. Had it, it was a necessity, right? It was a necessity. Like, yeah, I was, it's the mud. Like I always talk about the mud. Sometimes you have to go to the, through the mud to get to the other side. Yeah. But you're right. Like right now in my life, I have less stress. Yeah. I think it, it's partly like I, I have less stress that I'm managing, but also after Charlie was born, it put things into perspective. So I worry less about things that really don't matter. <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about things that actually matter and I'm not worried about the things that don't matter. Mm. And yes, less stress in my life, but also choosing what I decide to stress out about has allowed me the the mental bandwidth and freedom. I'll tell you, I feel lighter. I feel lighter. I feel at peace. I feel really good right now. But I think that's something that people need to recognize is that if you're going through a chapter of life that is super stressful, you had a death in the family, big life transition, maybe you're about to get married, new job, you might be on the verge of losing your job. Mm. Like if you have a lot of stress in your life, going into a big fitness build, say a marathon build, is not going to alleviate any of that stress. That's going to be another layer of stress added on top of. So it's having the self-awareness of auditing your life, realizing what you have going on, how much stress is associated with each one of those things, and then what can you actually realistically do in a marathon build and prep and is this the right time to go after the school or not i'm curious from the, the large amount of athletes that you work with how often do you see life transitions or stressors significantly impact their workouts and then their whole build big is it time. night and day big time i mean the most stressful thing that has happened uh, for any of my athletes in the last couple of months was um, a uh, a guy who sent me a message. It said, hey, I've just been um, deployed um, to fight with the IDF, right? Um, in Israel. 
And um, that's a stressful situation. Don't get it twisted, man. And so needless to say, he says, hey, man, I think I'm probably going to need to pause this marathon prep. And I said, you know, you probably do. You probably do. Probably smart. Yeah. You know, but um, lots of uh, lots of my my uh, my my U.S. military guys and uh, and ladies who I coach uh, will get uh, will get deployed. Um, I had um, um, you know a guy um, who was running in a hot a workout room on a treadmill on an aircraft carrier um, to stay fit. Um, but I'll be damned that guy that guy ran in the two forties in the marathon um, this fall. And, um, and that guy was, uh, well over a three hour marathon or a year and a half ago. So he got it done, but it was tough. We had to make some pivots. We had to make some changes. And, uh, that's, that's stressful when you're deployed and you're on an aircraft carrier and you're on a, on a, on a, on a treadmill in a hot little, you know, a uh, uh, cigar box size workout room. You know, I mean, these are, these are things that we have that happen. Um, I had one lady, you know, who, um, had to come and take care of her mother and fly from Europe, you know, and come to Florida recently. And um, it was tough, you know, and she ran a real gutsy race at the New York Marathon. And we were really happy with the with the, with the the performance because you got to compartmentalize it and recognize, hey, we're going to have to pivot either actually to a different race or pivot from our goal. Um, and it's a sign of maturity. It's a sign of emotional intelligence to recognize that pivots aren't always um, and almost never actually if it's for a good reason. Like, you know, I want to pivot. I don't want to run that marathon because I've decided I want to enter a binge drinking contest. Well, that's not a good pivot. I mean, it's not a good reason, right? But most of the time, it's a sign of emotional um, um, intelligence. It's a high EQ thing to be able to say, I'm going to revise my goal, but that goal is going to be my victory. Because I'm being fair to me, I'm being fair to the process, and I'm just recognizing this is where I'm at, and it's okay. So I might run a different race. I might run the same race, but with um, a different time goal in mind. I might have to go to running four days a week for the next two months because I've got a parent in hospice care who I've got to take care of. I still want to run the race, but I'm going to pivot. See, it's just a high emotional intelligence thing to be able to analyze your own situation, make fair and just conclusions about what you're capable of and then redefining your victory. That's the key, man. Well, I've seen this before with people and I, I could argue that I've done this myself mm -hmm. where they, they turn a hobby, which say is running and running <laughs> marathons into their full-time priority and they put that full-time priority, which is a hobby, above everything else in their life, being work, mm -hmm. being family, kids, responsibility, spouse. Because fitness can take over your life and the things that you're training for, which were once a passion and hobby, turn into everything, turn into your identity. And I think that's where you start running into some, some tough spots and spaces. I've been there before, trust me or you put that fitness goal above everything else. Yeah, um, and it's tough because when we're passionate about something and we love something so much and we get so much emotional fulfillment out of it, um, sometimes we think, well, if I just got more of that and I just put a lot of other stuff either on the back burner or just put them on ignore, somehow this is gonna make me a happier person. And I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Because once again, we're back to the all consumed versus all in mm -hmm. conversation. Um, now I have had a few runners um, and I've had these very frank conversations even this week with, with three of my runners. And if they're listening to this, they're going to know who they are. Well, we are having to start making some uh, um, some decisions and having some conversations about transitioning um, into a period where they do actually focus on running as a career and as a job. But we're talking about an infinitesimally small percentage of anybody who ever does anything in sport who has ascended to the level where they can actually say, I actually might actually try to do this for a living. I might actually just do this. This might be my job. 
But I mean, that's such a small number of people that we don't even really need to even have the conversation because that's not reality. That's just fantasy, man. I mean, listen, even I was a pretty good runner and I was smart enough. I had to figure out how to eat. That's why I went to law school because, yeah, sure, I was pretty good. But I wasn't good enough to ever do anything. And so I decided not to become all consumed with running. I was all in during the periods that I was in it. And I was training hard and having fun with it, even in law school. But I recognized that it could not, I could not consume me to the point where I, I ignored my fiance, who's now my sweet wife, Angelique. Nobody knows how or why you've been married to me for 22 years, but thank you for putting up with me. And I had to get my law school studies done and I had to do all that. And I couldn't just put all that on ignore to chase this thing that I actually really loved, right? Which is running because, you know, you got to you gotta prioritize your life and make sure that you're being fair, kind, and you're being, frankly, lack of a better opinion, being reasonable. Be reasonable. Right. Yeah. It's super important to... Uh to see it's, it's a level of self-awareness that is <laughs> necessary yeah man and, you, and a lot of times you'll actually be faster <clears throat> you'll be faster i've had people who've gotten a little too uh, uh close to that edge of being so close to it that they um actually started making some decisions that maybe weren't the best and so you backed them out and they actually sort of oh you could see their shoulders drop relax a little bit actually ran better they ran better well self-destruction is a real thing Sometimes, oh. sometimes people oh. ruin their own oh. yeah. progress and success by no other reason other than themselves. 100%. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of times to put this into some real terms, you'll see people, well, I can't miss that workout or I'm going to quote unquote fall behind. And I'll tell them, yeah, you go do that workout on that sore Achilles tendon and you get an Achilles tendon injury that knocks you out for three months, then I'm going to show you falling behind. I'll show you falling behind. Don't run for three months. One workout, ah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a drop of water in a big bucket, man. Just uh, uh, sometimes the best workout is not done, but the people who are so consumed where there's like literally all in on that to the ignorance of everything going on in the world, right? Um, and they're like, I must go run. It's like, hey, you know, you just finished work. It's 1130 at night. You had a huge project done. You had to get to the boss. You worked a 16 hour day. You know what you need to do? You need to go home and drink a cup of ice water, watch some horrible uh, 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 Seinfeld reruns and go fall asleep. That's what you need to do. Eat a meal. And eat, of course. That's right. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about the race itself coming up. Yeah, man. CIM, Sacramento, California, the California International Marathon. I've heard you talking about CIM for years now because apparently it's a fast course. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go run there for their last opportunity of the year to qualify for the Olympics or go to the Olympic qualifier. That's correct. Um, well, let's talk. Well, let's talk about CIM, the 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 race itself first. I'm curious. I've never been there. Right. Ne I've never seen the course. I've only heard great things. Tell me about it. Well, I mean, CIM has always been um, viewed as one of the fastest races in the United States, um, even before. Um, I had ever even contemplated running a marathon when I was a young teenager. I knew about the California International Marathon, right? What's really interesting about it is people think, well, that's just downhill point-to-point -point race when it's actually a fairly challenging course, which is interesting because it still runs so fast. Um, you typically get pretty good weather in Sacramento um, in December, right? Um, and that is one factor that's really, really good for marathoning is having nice, cool, relatively dry, most of the time weather. Uh, the other thing is, is that even though, um, it's a, a net downhill, it is, um, rolling and has some hills in it for the first 12, 12 and a half miles or so, then a few rollers after the half marathon. And then it really bottoms out nicely for the last many miles of the race to where it's like a racetrack, right? Um, and what we find is, is that a rising tide in life raises all boats. We usually have a bunch of really fit, really motivated, uh, really fast people show up to CIM. And it's almost as if sort of it's this tidal wave of momentum where everybody just gets rolling. And that's one of the magic things about CIM is people run really fast because there's other people around them running really fast. I've heard that. And that's what's going to happen. CIM, we're in an Olympic cycle. It's the uh, 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 the last day that the U.S. Um, uh, um, OC has set for hitting the qualifying window. 
um, uh, I'm actually going to have four runners in that race trying to hit an Olympic trials qualifier, right? And uh, we're fit, we're ready to go, and you're going to be in there in the midst uh, um, of that. And it's a really, really, it's very much of a momentum race. Now it's point to point. So they're going to bus you to the start right? They have buses and you go to a staging area, you get on your bus and then they'll take you to the start. So spectators and friends and family are not allowed at the start. So it is a unique start in that usually when you're at a big marathon, a big urban marathon, there's just crowds everywhere and there's music and it's a big sort of energized hubbub of activity. Um, but um, um, at CIM, it's just the runners and then the bus drivers and then the event staff. And then you take off running and you start in Folsom and then you run down into, um, into Sacramento. And uh, it's, it's um, um, one of these things that I want to make clear is that even though it's known, okay, for being a net downhill course, the IAAF, which is a governing body for uh, track and field and running worldwide. It's called the International Amateur Athletics Federation, even though the amateur part is sort of funny at this point because it's professional runners, right? Um, has a govern has a has, has a rule on net drop for a marathon. It's a certain number of meters per kilometer. A uh, marathon is 42.2 kilometers that you're allowed for it to be legal for uh, qualifying for international championships, the U.S. Olympic trials, breaking world records, national records, etc. CIM is an IAAF legal course. That's the reason why it's so popular is because the IAAF has determined that you can have a certain amount of net drop where it doesn't impact the actual athlete's performances enough where you can't get a relatively apples to apples comparison between comport. Uh, uh, performances on various courses, right? So CIM is an IAAF legal course, right? In other words, it's within the International Amateur Athletic Federation's uh, governing body's world rules on how many meters per kilometer net drop you can have to quote unquote ratify your result. That's the reason why everybody's going to CIM to try to get that last chance to qualify for the US Olympic trials. It's going to be just an absolutely electric, um, um, emotional, uh, the hairs are standing up on my arms. It is, it is going to be the race of all races in the United States this year. That's exciting. <laughs> it's going to be badass, man. What's, um, how, how would you compare it to say, you know, Buffalo? Buffalo was my last marathon I did. Other than that, like I've done the Austin Marathon. I've never done a point to point, never been bused mm -hmm. to a starting line. Mm -hmm. I'm used to these races having high energy, mm -hmm. you know, people out in the course handing stuff out. Mm -hmm. How could you compare CIM to any of these other ones? Uh, equally as high energy, um, uh, uh, the energy obviously is going to come from the amazing, um, um, uh, uh, motivating. Um, productive tension that you're going to have at the start line. And then as you start rolling down from Folsom, the crowds get, you know, bigger along the course. And then there are some places where, you know, it's a, it's a cheer tunnel coming through, you know, into the last 10 K. Um, uh, uh, it's a much bigger race than Buffalo. It's at a, it's a, it's an incredibly elite race, you know, um, you know, I mean, I would assume that the winner, you know, is probably going to be around 210, you know, um, um, at CIM. And Nick um, Bear. Huh? His name's Nick Bear. Nick Bears can run 210. 210, baby. Oh, my God. That's uh, under five minutes a mile, right? Um, five minutes a mile is uh, low to 11, actually. Um, uh, so, yeah, you really can't compare them. Uh, Buffalo was a, is, a, is an awesome uh, uh, regional marathon um, that was uh, – a really, really great experience. And I would encourage anybody that wants to run a great regional marathon in the early summer, late spring, Buffalo's a really good option for you, but just very different. This is a very um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, international race. It's an elite race. And um, uh, there's going to people be people out there who make running fast look really easy. I can assure you that it's not, but they're just, uh, these uh, these are different, different breed of cat, man. So I'm going to run New York City Marathon in 2024. Because I want to love that. I just want to embrace that experience. New York Marathon is uh, um, one of the great marathons in the world, and there's not even any debating that. I mean, I had FOMO watching everyone out there this past this past week. Right, it looked epic. 
But for me, like when I go for a PR at a race, I don't need spectators. I don't need energy. I don't need signs. I don't need the tunnel. This past week for my big 22 mile workout, I did that on an old abandoned airstrip. It's 1.2 miles in length. And I did the whole workout there by myself. Mm. That's all I need because I'm taking every mile by mile by mile and I'm, I'm feeling pace. I'm feeling effort. I'm thinking about the next one. I'm, I'm strategizing to get through this workout and through this, this effort. I don't need the, the frills, the whistles, all the extra stuff. But when I go and run a race for the experience like New York city, yeah, I want that, but I'm going to be dialed in. So I think, I think I will feel the energy though, from, from the field that is there, from seeing these super elite runners, just cooking and cruising. I will be motivated by that energy. Yeah, it is really motivating to be in a race where the competition um, and uh, uh, the participants in general are high caliber. Um, I too agree with you that if you need uh, somebody with uh, uh, you know a you know a freaking whistle on the side of a street, or if you need a pet band on the side of the street to be motivated to try, that perhaps you're just not motivated in general. Uh, you know, uh, somebody said, "Well, I've heard that that course is really boring about a course on a, at a marathon in the Midwest." And I once looked at the fella and I just said, "Listen, man, I don't have time, nor am I concerned with um, your um, emotional excitement about the scenery." Um, if they were going to run a marathon on an airplane landing strip, and I thought it was that was your chance to run a personal best, I'd be sending you to run that marathon. Your enjoyment and your boredom are literally 1,347th on my list of things to worry about for you. I don't care. If boredom and, you know, if you want, you know, I always love it when you see the description of a marathon course and it says scenic. And I'm like, that scenic? when it says a scenic course on the, you know, the coast of whatever, that means really fucking hilly. <laughs> That's what scenic means, you know? Subliminal. <laughs> right? <laughs> Love so, that. yeah, man. Um, uh, yeah, get, you know, when you're, when you're dialed in, when you're dialed in, it's sort of funny. I'll have people who have raced a course. Uh, New York. I coach a lady up in New York and she said last year was the first year she ever ran New York for fun. She said she had run that race four, five, six times in a row. And that was the first time she said she had ever noticed like 70, 80% of the stuff that she noticed on the side of the street, uh, you know, on the skyline, the scenery. She says, because I had never noticed because I literally had my blinders on and all I was concerned about was what pace am I running and how am I running? She said, I just blocked all that other stuff out. It's interesting. Yeah, we had a conversation with the BPN leadership team a few weeks ago. Yeah. Because we were talking about putting a uh, a GoGel billboard up on some marathon courses so that when people were running these marathons, they'd look up, they see the BPN GoGel. And the response was, well, first off, if you're in a race and you're not using the GoGel yet, you're not going to change your mind mid-race. And two, no one that's actually running that race is going to be looking at that billboard. They're going to be concerned with yeah. how far have they gone? How much further do they have to go? What is their pace? How do they feel? But I would like to point out that I'd be happy to meet them at the finish line and extol the virtues of using go gels versus whatever other gel that they used. I would be happy to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I've run... A lot of marathons, a lot of races, and I couldn't tell you one sign and one billboard on the side of any course anywhere in the United States in the history of ever that I've run. I can say that with a fair amount of certainty. No. I, nah. of, of all the races I've done, I nah. I remember parts of the race, but not the scenery, not the landscape, not the landmarks, but it's been these small moments in, in memories of like this turn or I felt this cramp here. Oh. I saw this runner at, at mile 17. Like mm -hmm. Small things you remember from the race. I guess my next question, you know, we talked about course profile. We talked about yep. CIM, the experience. What is the, the pacing strategy 
that we're taking going into CIM? Um, I like the question because it's um, a, a strategy that has to be based on uh, the course profile, your fitness, and your goal. And those are the three things that I always look at. And then, of course, you know, uh, uh, sometimes um, we have to take weather into account, too, um, if um, that's something that we need to be looking at. Um, being cautious on the front end because it is actually rolling and there's a there, there are some hills in the first half at CIM. Being cautious and being very measured in our approach and the way we sort of uh, uh, use our fuel, right? Our energy reserves. Um, uh, uh, marathons are a race in any running race where you start with your gas tank on full and the needle should be bottoming out below E right as you cross the finish line. And you got to figure out how to meet out your resources appropriately. So in CIM, we're going to be restrained early. We're going to run right at 244 pace off of the line. And it's probably going to feel quite doable. And I always tell everybody, if you're super fit and you're doing it right, the first 18 miles of a marathon should be boring. So when some people say, well, I was bored, or if they go out too fast and they say, but the first 11 miles felt so easy. And I says, yeah, but the problem was the other 15.2. I had this conversation just the other day with somebody. So we're going to take you out very, very restrained. We're going to meet out our resources really, really carefully in the first hour and a half of the race. We're going to get 14, 15 miles in and then when the course bottoms out, you get through the hardest parts of the course and we get to the nice, flat, straight stretches coming home and you've taken your gels, you've stayed hydrated, right? And you've managed your, your energy reserves and the pace. Then we're just going to be able to hit full send coming home. And we'll be able to drop that pace down um, from probably right around 615 pace, which is where you're going to start right? Technically 617 is 244 pace. We'll call it 615. And then if you're feeling good, I'm actually pretty confident that you're going to be able to drop that down. 611, 610, 609, 608. Your data has been so phenomenal and I'm very, very data driven. Um, you are what your workouts say you are. And right now your workouts say that you are incredibly fit and incredibly adept right now because you've synergized volume and intensity in a way that tells me that you're ready to really, really uncork one here. I can't wait to let it rip. Oh, man, I can't wait. I get so fired up about this shit, man. I tell you what, you know, I mean, there is nothing that fires me up more than, than saying, here's the plan, executing the plan, meeting or exceeding the expectations, Every single bit of the way during uh, 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 this, this this plan and then getting to the starting line with that anticipation, the moments before the gun goes off, when you're like, oh boy, here the hell we go. We're about to whoop some ass today. God, I love it, man. There's no better feeling. You know, this is, I would say my, my third inter-competitive yep. uh, marathon. Yeah. So I go out and race. I'm racing against myself, the right. clock, my previous times. <clears throat> this is the third marathon I've done where it's it's a real effort of trying to do something uh, significant for myself. Yes. The first <clears throat> sub three, then 248, now sub 245. And through those repetitions, that repetition builds confidence. Mm -hmm. But it also builds and uh, teaches you predictability. Yes. So you know, at this point in the build, I'm going to feel this. Mm -hmm. At this point in the prep, I'm going to feel this. At this point at the starting line, I'm going to feel or should feel this. If you do things right and you set the conditions to succeed. Last week was the, the peak of the build. We haven't started necessarily tapering yet, but we reached the peak of the build and now we're slowly reducing volume. Mm -hmm. After that 22 mile workout, I felt great. I know I asked you, how are you feeling? And I would have, I would have expected you to say, Hey, I feel good, but definitely a little tired. You're like, I feel hundred percent. Like you actually typed one zero zero percent. And I'm like, like, as in like, good, like, yep. Um, <clears throat> feel like I could have gone out and done another set. If you had asked me to do like another set of four mile, two mile, one mile. And I'm like, I'll be honest with you. 
my honest reaction, I was sitting out there in a cabin in West Texas in, in uh, right near Big Bend uh, uh, National Park on a little glamping trip. And you send me that. And I just stared at the data. And I had a two-word thought. Holy shit. It was that good. It was good that too. good. In fact, of all the runners that I've ever coached, and it's and 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 the workouts are relative to where you are, your talent, and all this, right? That was probably one of the five best workouts I have ever had a runner. I've ever had a runner run. It was just that good. I was just like, holy crap, man! I mean, this guy, this guy's gonna make me actually look like I have three brain cells when he goes and runs at CIM. It's been a good build. Yeah, it's been really good. It's, it's been, been good really good. Prep. Yeah. But after after that week, felt strong. This week, the week after peak of the build, I still feel strong, but I can tell I'm holding fatigue from the build. Mm. But what I, oh, I, I always get to this point. I know I'm holding some fatigue. I'm holding some inflammation. Like What happens with every single build is I get to this point, then we go into the taper. Mm. The taper which is just as hard physically as it is mentally and emotionally. <laughs> it's called the taper crazies. Oh my gosh, it's real. And you get these phantom injuries that pop up <laughs> that right? are a real thing. Yeah. But we'll reduce volume and intensity going to the taper. My body always drops a few pounds mm. in the taper because of this inflammation that I've been holding during the build. And we'll get to that day before the race. I'll do a shakeout run which feels like I'm floating. And then we get to race day that morning where it feels like I'm one of those little toys that was, you know, you're a little kid, you spin it up, but you're holding back before you let it rip. That's right. And that's how I will feel when we tow the line December 3rd at CIM. Mm. But it's all of these things that come together. What's so beautiful to me about a marathon build and a prep when it's done right, is you spend weeks training and then you do a successful taper and, and carb load, you top off muscle glycogen, you rest, you're recovered, you're fresh for the first time in months. And you tow that line in a shape and condition that you could have only achieved by the last couple of months of work. Mm. And that effort you're about to put forth for that day, the only way to get back to that level is through another build mm. or something similar too. So it's this symphony of all of these factors that come together and it's almost like the opportunity is yours. Seize it if you want it, drop it if you don't, but you have to set the conditions to get there. That's why it's so beautiful to me. We create our own opportunities in life. Now we do have opportunity that sometimes falls out of the sky for us. Um, <clears throat> some might call that blind luck. So what you do through adherence to process, through an intense uh, uh, willingness to uh, invest in the mundanity um, of life and the mundanity of that process, right? Because let's face it, um, those 11-mile runs every single morning are redundant, right? But that's the part of it that it makes it so rich. It makes it so fulfilling because you create your own opportunity. The opportunity is December the 3rd. Opportunity on December the 3rd is for you to go out and have the best athletic performance and the best athletic moment of your life. The opportunity is December the 3rd. The opportunity to succeed, the opportunity to have a transcendent performance on December the 3rd, that's all there. But it is only created by those 11 mile runs in the pitch black in on a hilly course in Nashville with nobody's looking in life we have to understand that we create our own opportunities for the most part okay and then when the window opens we have a choice to either dive through that window or let the window slam shut and then watch the rest of the world go by on the other side of the window mm. it's your choice man Take it or sure. leave it. Take it or leave it. So you're going to seize that opportunity on December 3rd and you're not going to drop it. Now, it's sports. Nothing's a guarantee. That's what's so exhilarating and exciting about it, right? Because 
if they were just going to just go hand out the medals, they would just go down a list, pick the guy with the fastest time uh, uh, um, previously, and just hand him the, 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 the medal and the paycheck for CIM and let him walk away and not run the race, right? So we still have to run the races. That's why it's sports. That's why we love it, right? Um, I mean, nobody would have predicted at the beginning of the season that the Texas Rangers were going to win the World Series. But they did because they created their own opportunities by being repetitively good throughout the season, making good decisions and playing well in the playoffs. Listen, you've been repetitively good. You've created your own opportunity. Now you're going to go and you're going to seize it with the full understanding. There's always a chance because it's sports. It's not going to go well, but you've controlled the controllables. And now you're on the precipice of something great. One of my favorite things you say when we talk after a big workout, say it's like a, a let's use last week, for example, Wednesday morning, eight times one mile repeats, big workout. Mm. It was a hard workout. And you asked, you know, how'd you feel? I was like, well, like it was hard. It was challenging. I'm not going to lie. And you say, it's supposed to be hard. Marathons are hard. And it's a reminder for a lot of people that when you go to, no matter how well you prepare and, and train for this race, when you go and run your best race possible and you empty that tank over 26.2 miles, it's, it should be hard. It is supposed <laughs> to be challenging and difficult. It should hurt. You will reach points, highs and lows throughout that 26.2 miles that feel like you're about to crumble and fall. Mm. And it's quickly followed by this high where you feel like you can just cruise for the rest of the race. That is what's supposed to happen. That's why we keep signing up for them. That's why we do it. It mm-hmm. is to push us beyond what we believe is achievable for ourselves. But through the process, learn that it's doable with the right effort. If marathons weren't hard, do you think as many people would sign up for them? No way. No damn way. Right? We look at the Boston Marathon qualifying time. And you had to be five minutes and 29 seconds under the actual established Boston standards to even get into the race this year. People worldwide, globally, are embracing hard. And I am, I am, I am so motivated by the state of marathoning and the state of mind of distance runners worldwide that they're leaning into hard, okay? Qualifying for the Boston Marathon is empirically difficult. It is hard. Marathons are hard, but more and more people are running them. Okay? Marathons are hard. And I think if they were easy, I agree with you, fewer people would actually try to do them. Why do you think more people are choosing to do hard things now, especially with running? But, you know, regardless, it could be cold plunges, Mm -hmm. ice baths. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. distance running, ultra marathons, whatever it is, why are people now pursuing hard, physically challenging events compared to the previous decade? I think that we're at an interesting inflection point, and I'm not going to get uh, uh, overly philosophical here or political, okay? But the reality is, is we have a certain segment of population who just want everything to be easy. They want everything to be given to them. Everything needs to be uh, um um, um, uh, you know, dumbed down to the degree that it's all achievable, right? And so what I think is, is we have a certain segment of our population that's growing, that's actually in search of the hard to replace the relative ease and the comfort of the Western lifestyle that we lead. And so I think people are out searching for that hard thing because they simply from a cognitive standpoint and from a philosophical standpoint are still, okay, um, 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 sort of um, beholden to that throwback, that past uh, where, where we want things to be hard and things were harder. So we have these parallel tracks where things are super easy, right? I mean, don't get it twisted, man. Um, I really like my air conditioned seats in my truck, especially because it's black leather and it was, you know, 70 plus days in a row of 100 degrees. Right. I like the comfort of that. But then um, uh, um, parallel to the comforts that we have, we then go and try to choose something hard to do. And so I think people are gravitating toward that because as comfortable as life can be in certain respects, let's go and make life hard because I think human beings still like to be chiseled. They like to be chiseled. They like to 
um, um, have to lean into headwinds. They like an uphill battle. We like it. Yeah, I think I we like it. I think that's the way we're, we're hardwired as a species. We still like hard. I yeah. 100% agree and believe that as well. Yeah. I mean, in our DNA, in our blood, we thrive for a challenge. We, we thrive for hard things physically as well as mentally and emotionally. And I think as the world has evolved and changed and catered to make things easier yeah. and softer and less challenging, um, like you were previously mentioning, you can, you can get anything you want in a matter of minutes or days, oh. whether that's food or shopping on your phone or Amazon Prime. Like, oh, I was about to bring up Amazon Prime. I wish I had been clairvoyant enough to go and take every single nickel of everything I ever I, I had 20, 25, 20 years, whenever Amazon was a thing when I thought they just sold books, but I, you know, I'm just wasn't smart enough to realize that. But yeah, everything is just right there, right there. Now, 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 now. Yeah. yeah. And, and the world is moving that way. That what, what used to be a hard life naturally is no longer a hard life. So we have to actually <clears throat> pursue right. challenging things to maintain that 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 thing that our bodies naturally thrive and crave. Yeah, I mean, think about it, man. Uh, 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 um, do you think uh, Neanderthal man, cavemen, think about it, before the invention of fire, before we discovered fire, do you think they woke up one day and go, you know what? Let's make life a little harder. Let's go run a marathon. Well, no. I mean, hell, you're just sitting there hoping you make it through each day. Now it's just kind of like, you know, we don't have a lot of those challenges, and it's great. It's wonderful. I mean, I'm not going to decry it. You know, like I always said, I don't, I'm not sure how much of a fan I am of camping because I didn't get where I went to go on vacation to act like I'm poor. I mean, I don't want to sleep on the ground. And I stole that one from my wife. I was like, I'm not going to – I don't want to – you know, but the reality of it is is we, we lean into hard things because there's still that part of our brain that really needs it. It does need – it needs it. Right. That's why a lot, a lot of guys like to hunt too. You know, why yeah. we like to go run marathons, why we like to go do cold plunges. It's why we like to um, climb Mount Everest. It's the reason why, um, you know, Sally McRae goes and runs multiple 200, 250 mile races in, 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 a, in a matter of weeks and months. I mean, I, I mean, well, there's no, there's not, there aren't very many humans and stuff. It's her, but, but you know what I mean? We lean into hard things. It keeps you sharp. It keeps you refined yeah, yeah, and man. sharp. Yeah. Agile and just you, it strengthens you yeah yeah you, know, you, you need that yeah so one of the questions um to pivot a little bit here one of the questions i get frequently that i would love to hear your take on and your approach you know i share a lot of my workouts mm -hmm. online i've shared a lot of my workouts this prep and i've shared a lot of the data mm. paces mileage all these things um I love the quote, comparison is a thief of joy. Mm -hmm. People will look at their total mileage and they will look at mine and they will be influenced to take their weekly mileage, which is say 45 miles and start running 75 miles a week because they see me doing that, which I would encourage against. Yes. Slowly ramp up volume. But where I'm going with this in terms of comparison is often uh, paces. And a lot of people don't know where to start with paces. Like say you want to run your first marathon. Well, what pace should I be, I be aiming for? Or I go to run a track workout with say 800 meter repeats, 1000 meter repeats, or a six mile tempo run. Mm. Where should I set my paces? And I know it's very specific to the individual based off of their experience, their, their ability to run, how fast they want to run. But is there like an umbrella answer, broad strokes solution for people on how to find paces just to get started? Right. Well, um, one of the big questions that I get asked, and I'm sure you get asked to it too by people who are really trying to find their way into the running space is what pace should I do my easy runs at? And so the starting point is you just got to go and run a little bit and you got to go and run uh, um, easy for a little bit before you can ever talk about running a marathon. And what I've told everybody is that easy is not a pace. Easy is a feeling. 
The same way hot is different from cold. The same way hard is different from soft and up is different from down. Easy is different from hard. And uh, run easy. Uh, uh, become run, what I refer to as running adept. Get to the point where you can run four, five, six days a week, three, four, five miles a day. And then you can start spot checking your data because we do have the use of of, of Garmin's and Corosis and, and, and whatever smartwatches you have. And it will tell you what your paces are. And you can start getting a feeling for what feels doable, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 miles. And you've got to build into it. And then what you really need to do is actually either consult somebody who is a runner or who is a coach and start formulating a few a few workouts where you actually have some designated paces that are constructed in a way to get a desired physiologic result, right? And you can start feeling your way through paces. If you can go out and you can run 18, 19, 20 miles and feel really, really solid at a certain pace, it's reasonable to hope that you could probably slow that down by maybe 10 seconds a mile and <clears throat> on a race day, tapered, prepped, fueled, probably hold that for a marathon, right? But there's so much that goes into it that my uh, encouragement is get started, go run, um, learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about yourself by simply just going and doing. And then when you start running more, you start getting familiar with pace and feeling and the difference between I'm dying and I'm feeling competent. Then you start can start looking at that and saying, I think I can hold this for a marathon. Or I think if I did that for 17 miles, slow it down by 10 to 15 seconds a mile, I can probably hold it for a full 26. That's a reasonable conclusion to reach, right? So, talking about easy running. Yeah. Um, my friend, Hel Sidibe, he made this post a few months ago when he was training for Western States 100. And to make sure that he maintained an easy pace, what he would do is he would take a tennis ball with him mm -hmm. and he'd bounce the tennis ball on the ground, kind of like a, a basketball, you know? He'd throw the tennis ball on the ground, he'd catch it, keep shuffling, hit it on the ground, grab it, keep shuffling, because it, it made him slow down. Fascinating. And it... it did something to just keep his mind off of trying to run so slow because oftentimes running slower is, is hard for some people. Because it's not sexy. It's not sexy. So after I saw him post this, actually, I was running one day and I was running by a tennis court. And I saw a tennis ball on the side of the road. Don't tell me. So I grabbed it and I started doing it. <laughs> Dude, it was so much fun, actually. It slowed me down and like I would, I would throw it down. I throw it hard, like let it go up in the air 20 feet, catch it. I'd fumble it a little bit, go grab it. But it forced me to slow down. So like that's one thing people can do. Take a tennis ball with you, mm -hmm. bounce it on the ground if you really want to slow yourself down. Mm -hmm. And it'll make you focus on something other than the pace. Right. Yeah, because if you think about it, when you're having to bounce a, a, a ball and catch it, you're engaging a part of your brain and you're taking that away from maybe just the focus on pace and just hurrying up and getting the run done. And it's a level of neurologic distractedness that forces you into a space to just simply divide your, 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 your psychological and your neurologic resources such that you just slow down and you just, you just, um, um, I'm theorizing that you actually default into just sort of like the easiest pace possible so that cognitively you can just focus on that ball as yeah. you're catching it, throwing it, catching it, throwing it. Another, huh. another yeah. thing that uh, the founder of Sisu Sana, Pete, does is he calls them zone two meetings. So he'll take his yeah. team out uh, for, for these runs, right? but they'll actually have an agenda for these runs. So there's things that they need to talk about and discuss for the business. Oh, I love it. And it forces them to run slow in like zone two so they can have full conversations because an, another way to describe zone two running or aerobic base building is just a conversational pace. Yeah. Go, go grab some buddies, go grab some friends, go grab some coworkers, have a conversation during those runs and, and make it super productive, but it'll mm -hmm. force you to slow down actually. Yeah, I tell people and uh, you know, some people listening to this are probably laughing because I've told them this. Um, uh, the rule is not be able to speak in full sentences while you're running. 
um, on an easy day, I want you to be able to speak in full paragraphs. That's how you know you're running easy. Yeah, and, and I'll grab people all the time and go run. Like people will come in for the podcast and we'll go for a run, we'll go for dinner. Because oftentimes if you don't know someone, it's easier to have conversations prior to going into yeah. a podcast. And when we go for a run, we'll have these, these full conversations that are, are paragraphs in length. And uh, it makes you slow down for yeah. one. But also I have this approach where if I go running with someone who's a lot faster than me, I always have these questions in my back pocket that are very open-ended that force them to speak not in paragraphs, but pages mm. so that I, I toss it over to them so that I can breathe at their pace. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. But you know, um, uh, uh, running easier um, helps prevent injury. <clears throat> running easier helps prevent you from feeling cooked on your hard days. And then what I tell people is we're in the volume business. We're running marathons. If you run easier and you're not just rolling fatigue over from one day to the next, one workout to the next, one week to the next, um, Simply put, you're just going to be able to run more. And at this juncture, um, one of the things that I've really, really begun to realize is, is if you slow down and you can simply get your volume up and then be really good on the hard days, that's how you get really good at this business. Right. So there's one, one last thing I want to hear from you. And mm -hmm. Jeff, you're obviously a very wise man. You have years of experience working with many different people and, uh, I always value what, what you have to say in the way that you say it. Yeah. The marathon owes you nothing. Not a damn thing. Nothing. And if you don't yeah. respect the distance, mm. if you don't respect the 26.2 miles, if you don't respect the effort, mm. it will crush you. I'd love to hear you just riff on, on that concept for a little bit and how you've seen people approach marathons with ego and be destroyed and then have seen people approach a marathon with respect and have succeeded. What does that mean to you? <clears throat> You're one of the, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, one of the best um, entrepreneurs in the United States. <clears throat> you are the best entrepreneur I have personally ever met. And one of the things that I'm guessing at um, but not totally because I know you really well at this point is that respect pervaded your approach as you got BPN growing. You respected the space that you were in and you were willing to listen and you were willing to respect what it took for other people in uh, other ventures, other entrepreneurial pursuits, what they had to do because you've got to respect what you're walking into, right? Correct. If you respect the marathon, the marathon gods will not rain down on you with the power of a thousand fire-breathing dragons. Respect the marathon gods because they are a spiteful, spiteful bunch of folks. Respect the marathon because the marathon will not respect you for running with a certain level of dumbassery and dumbassery is a, 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 a very intricate, very um, complex term that means you're a dumbass, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? If you're only in shape to run seven minute pace, don't try to run six minute pace and think it's going to work. And so having respect for the marathon, respecting what it takes to get fit enough to do it. Um, listening, being coachable. It's all about respect. But you know, um, well, I'll tell you what, you just opened up a Pandora's box here. Um, respect is something that I think that we all need to uh, um, look at globally right now. And I find that people who proceed with respect rather than um, obtuse arrogance and sort of a bull in a china shop mentality when they go into any situation, people who proceed with respect tend to have a higher chance of succeeding, respecting the marathon, respecting ultra marathons, right? I've had a lot of conversations recently about, um, um, you know, understanding what you're getting into if you're going to go run Leadville and really understanding what we're doing here. Respect um, entrepreneurial patience, respect 
uh, uh, what it takes to end up being the greatest tennis player in the world, right? And then when people tell you, hey, I've done this, this is some recommendations I have. I would highly encourage people to really, really dig in there and listen and try to implement some of the advice that they get. And life goes pretty well. It really does. I think a lack of respect for an effort mm. equals a lack of respect for yourself. Oh, yeah. We always have to respect ourselves. We have to respect ourselves enough to set ourselves up for success. And I, I, I think I've said this before to you. Um, in fact, I know exactly when it was. Um, I believe it was at three or four weeks prior to Buffalo. I was talking about the fact that you have to respect yourself enough to set yourself up for success. Respect yourself enough to put in the work. Respect yourself enough to value your commitment to a goal to then commit both the emotional and the physical resources to accomplishing the task. You know, disrespect for an endeavor and disrespect for a race um, in a lot of ways really emanates for a lack of self-respect. We don't respect ourselves enough to actually value the, uh, uh, the steps, the incremental steps and the progress that needs to be made to truly accomplish something meaningful. It's really important. I agree. I mean, respect is, in my opinion, one of the greatest skills and yeah. characteristic traits that you can you can learn. But if you've never been taught how to respect mm. others or an effort or yourself, it's something that you can also teach yourself. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, a, absolutely. it's a responsibility. Yeah, man. It's an yeah. individual responsibility. Man. So there's a lot of people who 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 don't respect themselves or don't respect the process or don't respect an effort. And there is, is often an excuse of, well, I wasn't shown how to do that, but it's all a, a self responsibility that we are obligated to maintain and adopt and implement yeah. to be contributing members of, of society in the world. And it doesn't mean we're always going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we're never going uh, to have um, a misunderstanding or proceed with a uh, 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 not volitional ignorance, but just true ignorance. Just like I just didn't know, uh, but seek to fix it. And that's what's so fun in looking at the marathon. Think about, you know, what did you run? 424, like in your second marathon? I don't, I'm, I'm trying to remember. 415. Right. Think about how much more you respect uh, the process and how much more you respect the marathon itself now than you did back then. And back then, it wasn't that you're like, you know, you're just a disrespectful a-hole. You just didn't know. I was ignorant. You were ignorant, but you uh, invested the time and the resources and the uh, sort of the emotional energy into uh, uh, learning what you needed to know, committing to the process, and look at you now, man. I mean, ignorance. Unbelievable. Ignorance is bliss, but bliss will kick your ass. Oh, bliss, bliss will, bliss will uh, take a bite out of your posterior. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, Jeff, I respect you tremendously. Thank you. And what you have taught me about the marathon, about the distance, about the effort, about the respect, applying that not only to running, but business and life as a whole. Yeah. I respect the fact that you've helped so many people through your platforms and mine, get faster and embrace the challenge of the distance of the race and, and learning through that that journey. And um, I'm super excited for CIM. I'm ready to kick ass. I'm excited for CIM. I'm excited to see all the work come to fruition for you and for all the other people who are on that starting line who dare to show up to be audacious. Um, I'm excited about the future of running. I'm excited about the future of BPN. And I'm excited about the opportunity just in one tiny, tiny little way to try to help make my life and your life and everybody's lives around us just even just a little bit better and just a little bit more fulfilled. And for me, that's the definition of success. Well, guys, December 3rd, 2023, California International Marathon. We're going sub 245. 
We'll see you there. He's got a first class ticket on the Ass Kick Express, folks. Dude, that needs to be on my on my uh my bib. I'm getting that print on something. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs>